I'm in the Roman town of Corbridge in Northumberland, not far from Hadrian's Wall, which this year celebrates 1900 years of history. And I'll be looking for clues about the lives of the early Christians that lived here. Welcome to Songs of Praise. In today's program, we enjoy some of Northumberland's treasures, including its glorious coastline, as we join a Christian birdwatching retreat. Jesus said to his followers, look at the birds of the air and learn from them. I visit Vindolanda, one of the most fascinating settlements along Hadrian's Wall, where new evidence of ancient Christians is being unearthed. We share the same faith. Yeah. It's an amazing thought. And to mark the fifth anniversary of the Manchester Arena bomb, we meet the Corbridge family who were there on the night. And Mark Delissa joins the Manchester Survivors Choir during rehearsals. I've heard it said. Adrian's Wall was built in AD 122 as the most northerly frontier of the Roman Empire. This world-famous structure runs across northern England, passing by Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the east and Carlisle in the west. Much of our music today comes from places close to Hadrian's Wall, and we begin right here at St Andrew's Corbridge with a joyful hymn of praise. Around 400 AD, as the Roman Empire declined, they abandoned their bustling settlement here in Corbridge, leaving the buildings to fall into disrepair. This proved to be a great resource for the developing Christian community. The walls of St Andrew's Church are literally filled with history, as parts of them were built from the original stones of the Roman settlement and Hadrian's Wall. The Reverend David Kennedy is the vicar here. How lovely to see you. Welcome to Corbridge. Can you tell me which of the stones are Roman? There's more research to be done in terms of which ones come from where, but if you really want to see something authentically Roman, you really need to come inside. Of course I do. Lead on. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, the remarkable thing about this church, it was founded in the seventh century by St. Wilfred, and we have a Saxon tower behind us. And so it tells the story of the coming of Christianity to ancient Northumbria. But more than that, this wonderful Roman arch, which we think is from the early second century. And so in this building, the whole Christian story is here in its architecture. And very few churches can say that. What's its story? How did it get here? Well, we think it once stood at the Corbridge Roman town, just as people crossed the River Tyne and then entered into the settlement. In the seventh century, they moved it stone by stone and reset it here and then built the church around it. I don't know whether you've noticed, we have all these grooves here. And one of the theories is that actually this is caused by Roman chariots being driven through the gate, probably rather badly. <laughs> a bit like um, my driving. Yeah, yeah, and kind of, you know, wrecking it and things. <laughs> the congregation here and the parish, what does this mean to them? Well, I think everyone's very proud of it. I mean, you know, we celebrated Easter a few weeks ago and I'm standing at the front of the church reading the story of how Jesus on trial just before his crucifixion stood before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And as I'm doing that, I look up and I'm looking at a Roman arch and it's as if time has simply disappeared. And I can't tell you how moving it is. And I think for all of us here at Corbridge to have that real sense of historical rootedness and continuity, open your eyes, you're back at the time of Jesus. from Corbridge is the Roman settlement of Vindolanda, which dates back to AD 85, just before the construction of Hadrian's Wall. Not only does this place give us insight into how the Romans lived, recent excavations have also told us a little bit about how they worshipped. Marta Alberti, one of the archaeologists here, explains about the early churches they found. So the one that we're standing next to uh, dates to the late 4th, early 5th century and is a typical basilica-style church. What is happening here is that Christianity is a sort of 
corporate religion from the fourth century onwards, everybody has to be a Christian within the Roman army. And they adapt pre-existing buildings by adding an apse onto them. So it comes down from head office you will be a Christian. Absolutely. But it is important that one message is sent out to all of the empire. So what we do have that is contemporary with this sort of corporate values Christianity is what looks like a baptismal font. <laughs> Shall we go and take a look? Yeah, how exciting. Um, this was originally a military building um, and it would have served to provide water for the horses of the cavalrymen. But at the same time as the churches were constructed, this stone there was flattened to provide access to this baptismal font. This isn't the only evidence of Christianity on the site. In the remains of a later 5th century church, they found fragments of what they believe to be a lead chalice that's now on display in their museum. It's oh. our best Christian find yet. It is a lead chalice with lots and lots of little inscriptions on. It's all symbolism. So you've got angels, fishes, palm leaves, repeated and repeated again to invoke the protection of God. So we go from something that's like a, a kind of, everyone has to get baptised, let's get them in, get them dunked, because this has come down from the emperor, to that chalice that is much more about personal faith and, and communion and owning that belief. Absolutely. Vindolanda offers the opportunity for amateur archaeologists to spend two weeks digging for artefacts. I joined Sean Church, and within minutes, the bit of beginner's luck, we found something. Oh. Oh. Now, is it wriggling? Okay, pinch it and wiggle. It's definitely wiggling. Give it a pinch and wriggle gently and pull towards you. Is it coming? Oh, yes, yes lovely. Yeah. Turns out I'd found the base of a 3rd century Roman Samian pot. Yeah, it's a nice piece of pottery. People are fascinated by archaeology, revealing the past. It, it, it just catches people's imagination, I think. Yeah. And what does it do for you in terms of your faith? Well, I think somewhere like here, because there is such a strong evidence for uh, Christ Christian communities here, you know, from the 4th and 5th century, that sense of continuity, our Christian continuity, that continuity of faith. But much has, much has stayed the same, the core of our faith. It's the same that they had here all those, you know, all those centuries ago.
Here at Vindolanda, they're marking the 1900 years since Hadrian's Wall was built with a crafty idea that everyone can get involved in. This is the official bunting of the 1900 festival. Isn't it beautiful? Penny, how can people get involved? So all they need to do is go onto our website, vindolanda.com, and we've got the uh, bunting patterns for knitting and crocheting, um, and they can send them to us in the post or drop them in on a visit. I love this fella. Look at that Roman centurion. Wow. So they'll be on display at the end of October, and then once they've been on display, they'll come down and we will uh, unpick them all and make blankets out of them that we can donate. Even time to get crafty. Northumberland is the most northern county in England and the least populated. But like the whole country, it was affected by a shocking event in Manchester five years ago. The bombing at an Ariana Grande concert resulted in the deaths of 23 people and over a thousand injured, many of them children. The survivors are still dealing with the after effects, including one family from right here in Corbridge. Shauna and her daughter Rihanna drove down to Manchester for the concert and were among the thousands who were caught up in the tragedy. Shauna, what do you remember of that night? It stays with you quite vividly, to be honest. Concert went great, fine, getting ready to leave. And that's when we heard the almighty bang. And at this point, everyone's panicking. I just knew something wasn't right, obviously, because the fact that everyone else was panicking obviously would make a little child panic as well. You're running for your life. She, she was ask, actually asking if we were going to die. Are, are we going to die today? It was really frightening. We feel really lucky that we are sat here today, you know, able to share the story, basically. Um, we're, we're some of the lucky ones. Thank you. Many survivors of the attack have found great comfort in support groups, including the Manchester Survivors Choir, which meets regularly to sing and share cake. Our own Mark Delissa, who's also a vocal coach, went to find out more about the choir and to help with rehearsals. Kath Hill set up and runs the choir. So it's five years now. How do you feel that the choir has developed in confidence? Yeah, I mean, massively. We started off with such a small group. We weren't really sure what we wanted to sing. Uh, we didn't ever know whether we wanted to sing in public. We, you know, we just wanted to be together and do something positive. <laughs> Christine and her daughter Alicia were both at the concert five years ago and are founding members of the choir. We've met some beautiful people that I now call my friends. Um, we support each other. We stand together in solidarity. Obviously, there's something so tragic that binds us together, but we've been able to obviously transform that into something that we can share for the people. 
The song the choir are currently rehearsing is called For Good. I've heard it said. One of the lines is particularly important to Christine. You'll be with me like a hamper in my heart for me when I sing that is I, those 22 people that didn't walk out of that foyer that night, um, they have all left an imprint in my heart. And when I sing that lyric, I sing it for them. My biggest question, again, one that really cannot be answered, is why? Why did God allow this to happen? And it's something that I battled with a lot. Um, the Bible verse that gave me the most solace, strength and kind of comfort is the light shines in the darkness and the darkness should not overcome it. So it was really poignant, like it gave an answer, like a clarity that what happened, that obviously was the darkness and we are like what we are trying to do now faith hope that is the light Northumberland countryside is a wonderful place to explore God's creation. It's also a lovely spot for a bit of bird watching. Can you hear them? One man who's combined his Christian faith with his love of bird watching is Mark Winter. For the past 18 years, Mark has led Christian bird watching retreats, and today he's brought a group to the Northumberland Wildlife Trust Reserves along the East Coast come towards the water's edge there's about 300 references to birds in the Bible in Matthew chapter 6 Jesus said to his followers look at the birds of the air and learn from them they don't spend all their time worrying about how they're fed they're just getting in on with it and yet they are provided for so I learn about God's provision I learn about God's love by just being immersed in watching wildlife I just absolutely love the 
the big space, just the peace and just listening to the birds. That's, they're a bird that's moved. In. When I get out here, I can feel the change inside me. And I'm connecting to the place and the whole spirit of the place. The start of bird watching can probably be traced back to St Cuthbert, who lived here in the seventh century. He clearly had an affinity with nature and he was very concerned to treat nature with reverence and respect. There's a local duck called the Eider duck. It's rumoured that they actually nested in his prayer cell. And he certainly said to his fellow monks, you must not harm them, you must look after them. Yeah, wow, look at that. The marsh, marsh area. area. That's amazing. I think bird watching for me is particularly close to prayer. And I find it very helpful in terms of prayer because prayer requires you just to be still. And there's nothing better than bird watching to just slow you down. It makes you listen and it makes you look. What makes the sun to rise? The power of God. At midday, Mark leads the group in prayer. It's a time to reflect and give thanks. The wind to blow. Christianity and birding go together nicely and they've helped me through some of the difficult times in life. I lost my wife nearly four years ago um, and be able to just get out into nature and be alone with God and see the bigger picture. At the end of the day, the sparrow is the one that really inspires me when I think about the Bible. Jesus said, five sparrows in the market for sale for nothing. And yet every sparrow is loved by God. And I just think that's remarkable. And that's why I run these retreats and I call them even sparrow retreats, because even the sparrows are loved. And if God loves them, why shouldn't we? Thank you.
Next week, Sean Fletcher visits Snowdonia National Park to discover more about early Christianity and modern day conservation. And James Lusted rides the Festiniog Railway. And now a prayer from some of those we've met today. Dear Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your creation, including the birds we see flying around us. Help us to protect and care for all living things. Dear God, we pray that you will give strength and comfort to all victims of violence, terrorism and war. Enable us to become channels of your peace in our communities and to serve our neighbours as you have served us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To mark Ascension Day on Thursday when we celebrate Jesus rising into heaven, our final hymn is Before the Throne of God Above. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>